All right, here we go. We have Baby Blue of the Platinum Group, Pretty Ricky, um, who's actually getting ready to turn himself in for 20 months in a couple of days, but we got a chance to chop it up right before that happens. Welcome to Vlad TV for the first time. Yeah, man, thanks for having me, man. Finally get to see the, uh, the ghost Vlad. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, actually, I think Pretty Ricky's actually been on Vlad TV like years and years ago, but this is our first time actually talking. Okay, that's what's up. Well, you know, we're going to talk about the whole PPP thing and, and, you know, the sentencing and so forth. But I kind of feel like people aren't defined by their worst moment. So I really want to get into your whole story so people really know who you are. And we'll eventually lead into that whole situation. Yeah. Um, okay, so you were born and raised in Miami, Florida. Yep. Born and okay. raised in Miami, Florida, man. All right. So what was Miami like in the 80s and 90s? Man, 80s and 90s, you know, this dope boy city. Cocaine cowboys, palm trees, don'ts, verts. You feel me? Strippers, stripper capital. You know what I'm saying? Okay. And your brother uh, is actually in the group as well, eventually. Well, um, which brother? Oh, okay. You have multiple brothers. Yeah. Okay, how big is the family? Family big, man. Big, ten brothers and sisters or something like that, bunch of cousins, bunch of niggas who brothers who 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 loyal. You know what I'm saying? All family, you know, ain't family and loyalty make you family. Okay, you said or something like ten brothers and sisters or something like that. That means that do you know how many siblings you have or is it? Nah, I don't know, man. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I mean, you know, you got a Jamaican father. You know? Right, right, right. You got a Jamaican father, man. You know, he a uh, roller stole. Bunch of kids. There you go. There you go. Okay. Well, uh, at two years old, you actually had a very serious situation happen to you. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, I was two years old. I was, um, you know, one of those kids grew up in the city of Miami. They We play with guns, you know what I'm saying? Um and I just was was used to playing with the gun so much that I ended up finding a gun in the crib. And when I found the gun, I'm thinking it's the toy gun. You know, don't pull the trigger. Boom, I, I end up with the scar right here. Uh, rushed to the hospital, you know, end up living. Okay, so you shot yourself in the head with an actual gun at two years old. Yeah, yeah, a real gun, 22, um, when I was a jit. Okay, well, thank God it was a 22, because anything bigger would have really... <laughs> it would have blew a nigga your head, off. head off. Yeah, it would have blew a nigga head straight off. Hey, man, it, it's a lot of kids out here, man. They they get shot with with smaller guns, man. What, what, what's a smaller one? A 38 or something? No, 38's bigger, I think. 38 bigger. 22. 22's man, the smallest one, I think. Man, they get shot with all kind of guns out here and don't make it, man. All right, we see all kind of tragedies out here, so I'm blessed, you know what I'm saying? Okay, and the scar on your face, that came from that situation? Yeah, yeah, the scar on my face came from that. Okay. Um, did a, like, who was actually there when it happened? Obviously, you were too young to remember, but, you know. Right. That's, most of, you know, it's like a it myth, happened, right? Like, it's like a myth. You don't really know. All, all you know is the stories of what they say, but you don't really know. Is it true? Is, is they lying? You know what I'm saying? Um, but they say that... Um, you know, it was one of my grandparents' gun, and it was like under the pillow in the crib. So, um, I think my my granddaddy was babysitting or something, and left me in the room. I end up finding a gun, and then playing with the gun. Boom, get shot. You know. All right. Well, thank God you're okay. Yeah, my daddy was mad about that man. He 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 rushed to the hospital, cussed my mom out. I just told you, tell that nigga take that gun out the crib. I told you that nigga couldn't be in the crib, all that. He's snapping. You feel me? Okay, so you're growing up in Miami in this big family. Uh, you know, you had the little situation at, at two years old, but as you get older, become a teenager, were you a relatively good kid or did you start getting, you know, mixed up and getting in trouble? As a teenager? Um, nah, I wanna I wanna say that um as a as a young kid, super smart, you know what I'm saying? I'm in school, I'm focused on on my grades. I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or something. And um end up getting into the music. 
because my older brother was doing music. And, um, you know, as as I got older, like when you saying like we started doing music younger before being a teenager. Once we once we got being a teenager, you know, what I'm saying now you we run around, we shooting dice, we hustling. You know, what I'm saying we making money, we flipping that we, um, you know, investing into the music. We going to the studio. We living that Miami lifestyle, you know. Well, in the course of living the Miami lifestyle outside the music, uh, any serious situations, any arrests, or was it just kind of just a little dabbling here and there? Nah, nah, man, I ain't, I ain't never get arrested like that. Like, you know, the police would come, they might lay a nigga down for doing something and let us go, you know what I'm saying? But nothing crazy. Got it. Okay, and then the group Pretty Ricky, does that form in 1997? Shit. <laughs> well, I don't know when it was for the group. No, Pretty Ricky was my brother first. You feel me? Okay. So my brother was originally Pretty Ricky, and then um, he ended up missing a performance or something for the radio station in Miami, Power 96. We did the show without him, and, you know, the girls went crazy. And it went from there. You know what I'm saying? Then we end up bumping into Pleasure at, like, a talent show or something like that. He was just there hollering at girls or whatever. He told me, you like, man, I want to get in the studio. I'm like, I got a studio, come to the crib. He came to the crib. First song we did was Grind On Me. Six months later, we blew up, boom. Okay, and the name Pretty Ricky, was that from the Martin sitcom? Yeah, it started off like that. Like we had to come up with a name and, uh, you know, Pretty Ricky, what they call him. We, we was ladies' mans, man. We The ladies loved us in Miami. We had like a big female following, you know? Right, and I actually looked it up. There's a, a couple of episodes uh, of Martin where there's this dude from his high school named Pretty Ricky who he's kind of competing with. And, yeah, know. that's Miguel Nunez. He played that role, Pretty Ricky. There you go. I'd forgotten his name, but yeah, Miguel Nunez. Okay, so, you know, you guys... Uh, hey, let me tell you, you a know, story about that name, though. We was, um, when okay. we first got signed to Atlantic, you know what I'm saying, they ain't really like the name like that. And... um. So they did like this big thing at the label where they wanted everybody to submit names. They su they submitted all kind of names like 305 boys, stuff like that, right? And um we we had this show with I think Snoop Dogg and I forgot who else was on the show. But Bishop Don Juan was backstage. So Bishop Don Juan back, he like, "Yeah, man, I heard what's going on. They trying to change our name." I said, uh, I said, "Yeah, they trying to change it, dog." He say, man, I got a homeboy named Pretty Ricky. Man, Pretty Ricky love the ladies. Ladies love Pretty Ricky. Don't never change that name. That name Money. He's like, that nigga made so much money off that name. And uh, that kind of stuck with me. So, you know, we kept the name. And then Craig Cowman um, ended up changing how we spelt it. So he put the Y's on the end of the Pretty and the Ricky because we were spelling it with an I-E at first. You feel me? Got it. Okay. So Pleasure P joins the group. Uh, you know, you guys start to, you know, make a lot of noise. And I guess Jim Johnson was one of the original producers. Yeah, Jim Johnson was original producer. He, he, you know, part of the team that, you know, discovered us with doing music. Um, Big Big D, Jim Johnson, Static Major was one of the songwriters on the team. Um, who else was down back then? That That's all I can think of right now. Okay, and then in 2002, you guys had a song called Flossin. Flossin, man, I forgot about that song, man. How you do all this stuff, man? Where you get all this info from, dog? Research, research. Yeah, man. yeah, we had a song, we had a song called Flossin that Jim Johnson produced. Uh, and the song, the song was heavy in the streets, though, the whole Southeast region. That was like our first local hit. Right, so that became a local hit. And then from there, you guys got signed to Atlantic? Nah, is Flossin, Flossin blew up first. Then, um, then my brother had a record called Superstars, um, with all of all of the 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 signed artists that was on Slip and Slide. So if you listen to like Take It to the House and how you got all them, you got Trick Daddy and this are uh, featuring all the other artists. He had that record. So that record was like the second big record that we had on the camp. So now we moving around. We going up and down the Southeast region. We doing shows. 
And um, I think that's when, you know, he ended up missing the radio show. Uh, we did it without him and got pleasure in the group and went from there. Right. So when you guys did Grind With Me, was that independent first or was that with Atlantic? Nah, we was independent first. We did we did that in my crib, man. I had to um I had to we had the studio in the crib, but my booth in the closet was like full of clothes. So we ain't really had soundproofing. Like you see how on that movie Hustle and Flow, how they got like the the cardboard boxes stapled up to the wall. We had like jackets and shit all over the closet to do the soundproofing. And I mean shit, that was the I was the engineer. That was the first record that we did together. And um you know, when Pleasure came, I ain't even know him like that. You know what I'm saying? So he came, we ended up working to like, I want to say like four in the morning, um, laying like the lead vocals for Grind On Me. And then niggas spent the night. We ordered some pizza the next day. We like, fuck it, we ain't done. Let's go again. So we started recording the second day. Same thing till four in the morning. Fuck it. One more time. We go the third day. That's when um, I did my verse and we did the in and out shit. Um, when I hit him, my makeup set, and he seen the, oh, all that shit, the back and forth shit, like the signature sound of Pretty Ricky. That came like the, the last day. And then a nigga was like, man, nigga, you might as well move in, nigga. And um, he was like, the nigga, he called home. He was like, he was like, yeah, I'm going to just check on, check on the crib. And when this nigga called home, you know, everybody that he was hustling with, them niggas all got locked up. So he kind of ain't had no choice. You know what I'm saying? It was like, a blessing for the nigga that he was at my crib. So he ended up staying and shit, we just kept recording and we did AJ nothing but a number, Shorty B my all like all those big records off that first Blue Stars album. We did all that was was before Atlantic. You know what I'm saying? And shit, once once at once Atlantic got a hold of well, hold on, let me backtrack. So after we did Grind on Me, we played it for Jim Johnson and we played it for Big D and they end up um, like redoing the music for the record. So when we put the song out, the shit blew up on Power 96. It's like the number one most requested record in the history of Power 96. So then DJ Khaled got a hold of the record and he broke it on 99 Gems. He's like, oh, nigga, you heard it. You heard it from me first. We, nigga, all that shit, right? So then uh, Khaled blow the record up on, on 99 Jams. And then, then Craig Cameron gets a hold of the record. So then Craig is like, who, who is this group in Miami with this fucking record grind on me? So he flies down. So this, he, when he fly down, um, they tell us, meet him at the Lowe's Hotel. You want to meet the group? So we pull up. We jump out. You know, back then, we used to wear like, like the shirts with the, with the um, teddy bears on it and shit or the little glitter out. Like, we used to make that shit, right? So now when, we pull, when he pull up, when we pull up, it's some, it's some dudes standing outside. This motherfucker got on a fucked up wrinkly ass t-shirt and shit. And uh, so we jump out, you know, and tell the, the dough man, we like, yeah, we here to see Craig Cowman. We lit, right? So he like, um, he like, yeah, right this way. You know what I'm saying? He got on some dirty, some dirty jeans and shit. So some sneakers on. So we go upstairs. And um, when we get upstairs, he say, all right, one, one minute. He try to open up the door. The door, the key don't work. So we, so you know, we young and we kind of got discouraged. You're like, fuck, this shit going bad. The key ain't working. So he go, he come back. You know, we still waiting on Craig Cameron. He opened up the door. He said, well, why y'all waiting, man? Let me see what y'all got. So we grabbed a nine spoon for us, all that shit. And we started rapping. And that motherfucker, like, he pulled out the contract. Like, I'm Craig Cameron. I want to sign y'all right now. He like, what you want to do? <laughs> How much money you want? What you want to do? Sign right now. And so my old boy was like, he was like, nah, we ain't going to sign just yet. We got a lot of labels calling, but we got some more shows like tomorrow at for the MLK parade or some shit like that. Come to come to another show. Man, he, come, he, he missed the first MLK parade and the girls bust through the barricades chasing us and shit. We like, dang, he ain't make it. We go to the next one, Pleasure Mama performing. She in a band. She performing on stage, the whole crowd done disappeared. Yeah, sorry, Ma. <laughs> so she performing, the whole crowd disappeared. We out there like, fuck, he finna cut of this show, ain't no crowd. Man, he pulled up. I don't know if God put them people there, dog. By the time Craig Cameron got out of his truck and got on that stage, the whole field was full. The whole field was full, thousands of people. We perform, 
same thing. We do we do grind on me. By the time we hit the little slide or whatever, all the girls chasing us off the stage. So we running. He like, get what they want. They the Black Beatles. Flew us to Atlantic, and it was done daughter. Signed the contract, Jive Records calling. They like, we, we going to give you a million more than what Craig Cameron trying to give you. My daddy like, nah, man. We, we told Craig we going to do it. Craig promised he going to take care of my boys. And he did. She he made us number one priority at Atlantic. There you go. And uh, Grind With Me hit number seven on the Billboard charts. Ends up going platinum. Uh, and when you look at it on Spotify right now, it's at over 100 million streams. And this is way after it got released. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100 million streams. Platinum. Shit, back then, we was like one of the first artists to go digitally platinum. You know what I'm saying? Like, that was new. The, they was experimenting with all that shit. It was us, Rihanna, T-Pain. All that was new. This was before Soldier Boy came out. You know what I'm saying? And... They used to have Jamster. Remember that? Jamster ringtones yep. and shit. So they really was experimenting with this digital stuff. And, um, you know, we had the best of both worlds, man. We got we got to do physical sales and digital sales. Yep. Yep. And then, you know, in 2005, you guys released your debut album, Blue Stars. Debuts at number 16 on the Billboard charts. And then within a couple months, it goes gold. Yeah, that shit went gold fast. Like, we end up... Um, we end up touring on the Scream tour with with Bow and Amari on them, and we sold like thirty thousand units every week on tour, all the way up until it went it went go, shit it, it did numbers every week, man. Right, you guys went on the Scream Four tour. We did Scream Four, with, uh, Scream Five, some shit like that. We did a bunch of them. Right, I mean Scream Four in two thousand five when when you uh, dropped your first album that was with Amari on Bow Wow, Chris Brown, Bobby V. Uh, and a bunch of other acts as okay. well. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, what was that like to go from, you know, some local kids in Miami hustling, you know, trying to get your music out there to platinum single, gold album, the biggest, you know, kind of teen tour in the country, like, you know, girls screaming in, in huge stadiums and everything? Man, it was a lot of pussy. It was a lot. <laughs> hey, man, we were so young and dumb. We like, man, we, we trying to go platinum, man. We got a fucking million hoes, man. We got, if we fucking million bitches, we going platinum for show, sure, nigga. So I'm talking about we had a whole flow of bitches, dog. We, man, it, we were crazy jits, dog. We were young and dumb. We had, we had fun, dog. We had fun, man. We used to be sending bitches to, to niggas' rooms and shit. I ain't sorry to call them bitches and shit. We sending girls and shit to niggas' rooms and shit. Like, we, we really did that, man. Like, we came, we came in an era where they weren't even really making sex music like that no more. You know what I'm saying? It kind of like died out. And, um, you know, we came with some real sensual, risque lyrics that um, opened the door for radio right now where, you know, niggas could be saying a lot more explicit content on radio now. Because they, they used to try to blackball us, dog. Like in like the Bible Belt, man, they'd be like, man, we ain't playing that. So we used to have to do two, three versions of a record. We got Grind With Me, Grind On Me, Ride with me, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ride on. We got we got so many versions. And and then back then, back then they used to have um Walmart used to sell albums. I don't know if they still sell albums. I don't know the last time I went to Walmart, but they um they used to sell albums back then and do they only sold clean versions. So we used to do the dirty version of the album and then have to do a clean one just for Walmart. We was Walmart number one seller, you know what I'm saying? And I mean, it, it it just was a lot, man. For some kids coming out of Miami, we ain't really had no inf influence or no cosign. You know what I'm saying? Ain't like, you know, we had a feature from, you know, Trick or Trina at the time. They was the biggest out of Miami at the time. It wasn't no no Ross yet. You know what I'm saying? And T Pain was from North Florida. It wasn't no Plies yet either. Pleasure Pleasure did the record with Plies that ended up blowing up. Get you wet, I think they called it. So yeah, shit, we we had to pay it away, man. We we did that, you know. Right off that uh, same album, uh, the second single was "Your Body," which uh, debuted at number twelve, and it's still at forty million streams on Spotify. That was a big song as well. Yeah, that was top ten pop. That was a big record for mm -hmm. us too. Your body. Yep. Okay, 
So then the next year, you guys are kind of gearing up for your second album. And uh, the first single is uh, On the Hotline. Yeah, On the Hotline. Uh, that comes out, hits the Billboard 100 again, and it goes platinum. So here you are, you know, because usually that sophomore album is that hard album, you know, the sophomore jinx. Because usually that first album, a lot of artists, it represents like five, six years worth of work, you know. And then after you have a hit first album, you got to turn around and make another album in a couple of months. And that's where a lot of artists stumble. But boom, you guys have another platinum single off your next album right off the bat. Yeah, the thing about it, man, we we was very influential in, in like writing our music and producing as well. So even with that second album, the label ain't even know we was working on the second album. You know what I'm saying? We went in the studio, started cutting the records. I think I called Static and had him fly down and help with the harmonies of the record. And um, we started work. We started working on the album. And I want to say, I want to say Craig Cameron came down. Matter. I want to say we drove up and played Atlantic the album. We went up in the tour bus, played them late night special, and Craig Cameron was like, "Oh shit, y'all got an album." He was like, um, okay, let me let me get some other producers and songwriters on the album. So now when he came down to Miami, he he tell us go to Circle House. We go to Circle House. He like, let me hear what y'all got. Let me, so we playing the new records and shit. And he like, all right, tell me what y'all think about this one. Man, that nigga cut that shit on. Nigga, it was an R. Kelly record. Now back then, R. Kelly was the shit. This nigga was the biggest shit. Nigga said sliced bread. We like... We like, nigga, this nigga just played as an R. Kelly record. That nigga like, he want 250000 for that bitch. So we we went and recorded the record. And, um, man, we did the record. The bitch was so raw. But um, we end up going back in the studio with Static one more time to do one more record. We like, let's do one more. And the last record that we did was on the hotline. We left out that bitch 9 o'clock that morning, jamming that shit, went back to Atlantic, played all the songs for, for the label. And the whole label went crazy by On The Hotline. And that's how we knew that was the first single. Right. And then that next year in 2007, you guys drop your second album, Late Night Special. And that goes number one on the Billboard charts. Yeah, number one on Billboard, five, five consecutive weeks. Um, you know, and that was my first time really getting my feet wet with the production. And... Um, I think Jimbo was mad at me about that. But Jimbo, I love you though. You know what I'm saying? But it, you know, I was I was like Jim protege, man. I was so young in the studio, learning from him, learning how to engineer, learning how to produce. I'm in the studio with static, perfecting the writing. Static ain't even used to let niggas write with him in the studio. So I'm in the studio writing with him, you know, perfecting my craft. So that second album, I really felt like I wanted to give it a go. You know what I'm saying? So if you look at the credits, you know I got an executive producer credit on that. Well, I mean, it's one thing to have a, a platinum single. You know, a lot of artists are one-hit wonders and have a platinum single that just comes and goes. But to have the number one album in the country, that's something a little bit different. That kind of puts you in a whole different conversation. So when that happened, what really changed in your life? Shit, we were beefing, boy. When that, that number one album came out, we was we were beefing so hard internally in the group, um, cause we were having management issues and shit, and you know, pleasure pleasure walked away at was the first one to walk away. Even though he sat down with me and we talked about it, and he was like, "Man, I'm a um, I want I'm finna go do a solo record, you know, to make more bread." You know what I'm saying? So we talked about it. He let me know it ain't like he just abandoned the group, but management felt like he stepped away from the group and abandoned the group. You feel me? And it was it was a hard time because Atlantic Records, we we like they number one selling Urban Act. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, shit. It was conference calls, meetings after meetings. It was security on security. It was a lot of, lot of conflict at that time. We was their number one selling Urban R&B Act. T.I. was the number one Urban Act. Well, right. I mean, you got this number one album and suddenly the lead singer decides to leave the group. Right. So it, it was crazy. And he he tried to leave before we did the album. We had to do the album through the through the beef. You know what I'm saying? We still end up recording through the beef. But at times, we'll have every studio in Miami booked out. You know what I'm saying? Just producers in one studio, 
um, pleasure in one studio, background scene in another studio, we rapping in another studio. You know what I'm saying? It, it was nuts. I mean, from your point of view, what was the real reason why Pleasure P left the group at the height of your success? It was money issues. It was the same shit that you see Meek Mill and them talking about right now. And, you know, when you when you're a part of a label and when we young, when you young, you don't really know this. So it's easy to, to, to make a mistake and could possibly lose everything. Right. But to anybody out there that's, you know, watching this and, and could learn from this. Man, them labels got to get their money back. Whether you sign to a production company, a record label, like I seen, you know, I don't even like speaking on other people's situations, but so I ain't going to say no names, but any artists that, that get signed to a major, nine times out of ten, they had an investor that owned a production company that put money up for them first. So that deal is finna go through that middleman first. And a lot of times... The artists don't see no bread. You know what I'm saying? By the time the label get they cut, the, the middle the middle label get they cut, the production company or the record company that you signed to as an independent, I mean, as a, a, a yeah, independent artist signed to an independent label, man, you ain't getting no cheese off that. You know what I'm saying? It's like now it's groundbreaking to see, you know, the new artists independent. They got their own labels. They could distribute their own shit. You know what I'm saying? We, we blessed we can do that. Because we independent. Atlantic Records, they let us off. You know what I'm saying? Because we asked for that. And they blessed us like that. So now we can distribute our own records and make that bread. But back then, we couldn't. Back then, that shit, you know, had to go through the, the pipeline. You feel me? So Pleasure, he, at the time back then, he just was aware of it a little earlier before we was. Probably because he the singer in the group. And... He gonna be exposed to more people trying to pull him in different directions or give him game, in other words. You know what I'm saying? Well, uh, Pleasure P leaves the group. And you guys are, I guess, trying to figure out who the new lead singer is gonna be. And then in 2008, right around, you know, right around that time, Static Major, who you guys had had all the success with, ends up dying at age 33. Yeah. Yeah, Static died at 33. That was deep. I'm in the studio. Steve Noah called me. I remember that shit like yesterday. Steve Noah called me. He like, yo, did you hear? He like, nigga, Static dead. What? I burst out in tears, man. That's my nigga. What you mean, Static dead, man? And, um, yeah, that shit changed shit, dog. You know? That's a nigga, nigga, man. Yeah, and I guess, was it right around that time where he did Lollipop for Lil Wayne? Yeah, that was right around the time. Give me a second, yo. Yeah, that was, um... Yeah, he had just did Lollipop. He did Lollipop. I think he did that with Pleasure, too. I think Pleasure helped write that shit. They got a Grammy for that record. And, um... Yeah, man. Static, static, it was his time, you know what I'm saying? They had, look, that was Lil Wayne's biggest record. That I, I feel like, I mean, I don't know if I'm right or not, but I think that was the turning point in Wayne's career where everything went crazy after that, you know? I, I remember, like, watching interviews with Wayne used to be tripping, like, man, why y'all ain't playing my record in New York? Shit like that. And when he did that Lollipop record, it was, it was a big crossover record. And, um... Yeah, yeah, static, man. He ain't make it out the hospital, dog. He, niggas, sometimes niggas go in and they don't make it out. You know what I'm saying? That's why I got I to gotta count my blessings, dog. Like, nigga, I done been in the hospital a couple times this year, man. Like, nigga, I'm still living. That's a blessing. Yeah, I guess he had some sort of medical procedure, and he ended up passing away because of that procedure somehow something went wrong or yeah i think they put a tube or something down his throat or something and that shit hit some shit and you know he ended up dying from that i ain't really exactly sure we it's such a touchy subject we don't even talk about that like all the family and friends because it came out of nowhere you know what i'm saying so we kind of really don't really talk about it too much 
Yeah, man, listen, I'm sorry for your loss. I never got to meet him myself, but, you know, like that Lollipop record, like you said, that put Lil Wayne in a whole different category. Like Static, you know, Static Major was about to be in a whole different category right along with that, even though he had a lot of success with you guys and, and other productions. I mean, that record was just, was on a totally different, you know, stratosphere. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a shame he didn't get to experience it himself, man. I'm sorry. And I think it switched Wayne into, into that R&B that male R&B stuff that he started doing with Drake, with the I wish I could fuck every girl in the world and the Bobby Valentino, um, uh, like a cop car. We, you know what I'm saying? It took him there, which, which then made it where you can have the Drake and the Nicki. It made sense for cash money. But before that, it kind of didn't. They were such a hardcore group, you know? Yep. Yep. Okay. So... You guys are working on your third album. You guys get a new lead singer. And then, you know, like you mentioned, Atlantic lets you off. And then you guys signed it with uh, Big Cat Records? Nah, Big Cat kind of kind of brokered a deal with Tommy Boy for like a one-off record. And shit, we just trying to keep working. You know what I'm saying? It still wasn't, it wasn't no distribution channels yet where you can massively distribute your records and get um, on all the platforms. That didn't exist yet. So we end up doing this one-off with Tommy Boy, um, who, you know, they used to have, um, what's the group? You down with OPP? Yeah, you know me, what's them? Uh, Naughty by Nature. Naughty by Nature. I think they had Naughty by Nature signed. And um, so, you know, we, we, we gave it a shot. We went and seen what they could do. You know what I'm saying? They was talking the right money or whatever. But yeah, Big Cat, who had Gucci Man, he kind of middle, he middle man that deal for us. You know what I'm saying? Right. So that album gets released. Uh, I mean, it charts, but I think it charts like number 97. Yeah, they, on the chart. they to go from number one to 97. I'm sure it was a bit of a blow. Yeah, it was like, nigga, what y'all doing? Like they tried though. You know what I'm saying? I think they tried it. Just they, they, it wasn't that Atlantic machine that understood the. And you know what? With any label, man. When you work in the artist, it's, it's organic. When you go into the building, you got to build a rapport with everybody in the building. We went from being in Atlantic that got, you know, a, three floors, you might as well say, you know what I'm saying, to Tommy Boy, which is working out of, you know, a small building that was smaller than TVT at the time. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I mean, we had big expectations because we was a, a big group, but it probably was too much for them to handle. You know what I mean? But... I don't know. It did shit. It we ain't had that 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 secret ingredient. We ain't had pleasure P on that bitch. You know what I'm saying? That that plays a major part too. Right, because you guys kept you know dropping you know some projects here and there. And I think in 2011 you guys did a Sex Music Volume One. Yeah, we did a mixtape called Sex Music. Yeah, shit yep. did all right. And was R. Kelly uh, featured on one of the songs? Man, there was all kind of niggas on that shit, man. It, I, I can't remember. I can't remember like who who really was on the record because just that time so blurry, you you going way back, but we did we did a lot of remixes on that record. Very um similar to how Wayne was putting out those mixtapes. We took that approach, you know what I'm saying? Like nigga, we gonna drop 50 motherfucking records, 50 features, 50, you know what I'm saying? We just gonna drop all this music and put it in the atmosphere. Right. Well, the song I'm talking about is uh, the One Night Stand remix, which features, you know, Pretty Ricky with Chris Brown, Carrie Hilson, and R. Kelly. Oh, nah, man. I might have jacked that, though. I might have took that oh. and made him flip that, <laughs> okay. and edit that bitch up and did that. I might have did that. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay, so you guys never worked with R. Kelly because the, the music yeah, we was did. so similar. Yeah, we did. Oh, we did. did. We did. We did a record with Kelly, but we ain't put it out. We we uh -huh. we remember I told you we did that record for that two hundred fifty thousand, and was like okay. shit, man. We ain't finna spend that bread that two fifty. Boy, I put my mom in the house for that. You know what I'm saying? Shit. Okay. I mean, were you ever in the studio with R. Kelly? Nah, nah. He sent that bit. He sent it to Craig, and then Craig sent it to us. We went in and did it. You feel me? Got it. I would have loved to work Got with Kells though, man. That nigga, he's a genius. He's a musical genius, man. Outside of all his personal thing that he got going on, musically, he's a genius. Oh, yeah. I mean, Boosie, you know, was a regular on my show. He's determined that nobody could beat R. Kelly in a versus. <laughs> he might he's be determined. right, dog. 
He might be right. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's just one of those significant artists. You know, it's like you can't take away his talent. He might have made some mistakes. You know, allegedly. We don't even really know. You know what I'm saying? We don't really, really know. You know, it's all hearsay. It's what one person say versus what somebody else say, right? Um, but when it comes to that music, man, that nigga crazy, man. The melodies, the, the man, it, shit, we wouldn't be doing music if it wasn't for R. Kelly, dog. Like, nigga, I remember I was a kid, nigga. My mama used to clean the crib to R. Kelly and Tony Braxton. <laughs> you feel me? And Uncle Luke, nigga. Uncle Luke come over and go down with the bro. <laughs> yeah. So by 2015, Pleasure P comes back to the group. I, okay. You tell, hey, you telling me some of this stuff, man. I don't know the numbers, you know what I'm saying? Okay, so 2015, okay. P come back. You feel okay. me? Okay, and what, what gets Pleasure P back in the group again? He, uh... Was it his birthday party or Flo Rida? It's one of these niggas' party. I, I, it might have been his birthday party. And some kind of way, I end up in the club with him. And when I end up in the club with him, we ain't seen each other in years. And we just started talking. You know what I'm saying? We started talking. And it ended up turning to a long conversation. Well, he had some misunderstandings about some shit, and maybe I did too, or whatever, but we came to like a a, a resolve, you know what I'm saying, and we kind of squared everything away, and then we made the decision to do music. We made the decision. We ain't right off rip jump back in the studio, though. We made the decision, and then um, I think he started sending me some records that he had wrote and produced and this nigga was like nigga he, he was way raw too you know what i'm saying he, it was it was night and day from you know 2000 and whatever that was when we was doing the first records now this nigga is a beast so when he sent me these records i'm like oh shit this shit hard this shit hard and um so right away i started doing my verses and then now we had a foundation because once once you got pleasure on that hook, and then I do that first verse, and I put that Bay Blue Woe on the front of that bitch. They know it's a pretty Ricky record. You feel me? Yeah, I mean, and Pleasure P had a lot of success on his own. He did. Uh, he did. You know, Boyfriend Number Two was a big record. Did You Wrong was a big record. I Love Girls was a big record. Letter to My Ex was a big record. I mean, really, that first solo album was a pretty big album with a lot of big singles on it. Yeah, Pleasure had a lot of success solo wise, and, um, Shit, I was happy for him, you know? Like, shit, we, we coming from the same camp. We from the same city, you know? I'm happy for him, you know what I'm saying? Yep. That's my brother. Okay, so then in 2018, uh, you start doing Love and Hip Hop Miami. Okay. What made you jump in the whole reality show thing? <laughs> you know what, man? Real shit. I just seen everything transitioning to TV. I seen, I seen the music industry um, evolving and I seen artists in order to stay relevant in this game had to have a multimedia um, presence. It couldn't just be music. It had to be podcasts. It had to be radio shows. It had to be television, movies, um, sitcoms and reality shows. You know what I'm saying? So me trying to make sure that I, I keep Pretty Ricky relevant and current when we got the opportunity to do Love and Hip Hop, nah, I couldn't turn it down. You know what I'm saying? And I was one of them niggas that when Mona Scott was like, oh, she coming to Miami, I'm like, shit, you can't do Loving Hip Hop Miami without Pretty Ricky. So I'm hitting the phone like, hey, yo, hey, I got the mansion. I got the gold whip. I got the, I'm sending her pictures like, what you need? You know what I'm saying? Like, if you come to Miami, you know what I'm saying? Like, we down, Pretty Ricky down. You know what I'm saying? So when they came and I think they casted Tip Drill and Trina and shit, 
and Trick. Oh, hell yeah, we finna be part of that. Nigga, this my Emmy. You know what I'm saying? We living legends. It, to me, it's it's even though it's reality TV, it's still, it's still documenting the success. It's still giving accolades to my brand and my group and everything that we built. You know what I'm saying? To represent a city. To we the we we I want to say shit. We down to the only group up out of Miami, you know. For when I was a jit, we thought H Town was from Miami. It's I don't know no other groups. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah, but for but for the city girl, shit, it wasn't no other groups. You know, they're a duo. Shit, we multiple members. So hell yeah, nigga, loving hip hop. That was like, that was like a trophy. You know what I'm saying? So. I mean, we didn't get on there, and, you know, we got on there and talked about this music. We put the album back together, and then we did two successful tours after that. You know what I mean? So it definitely catapulted Pretty Ricky back into popularity and made it a bigger household name. We was already big, but being on TV make you bigger. You know what I'm saying? Which is why you, you see the type of success that a Kim K have. You know what I mean? Like... TV is, is everything, man. Right, because that next year, you guys go on the Millennium Tour with uh, B2K, Mario, Chingy, Ying Yang Twins, Lloyd, Bobby Valentino, which uh, was a big tour. Yeah, it was a big tour, man. The, the, the biggest tour. Highest grossing urban tour. You know what I'm saying? I think only tour topped us was um, Justin Timberlake. Yeah. Yeah, we had the biggest tour that year, man. In, in our world, you know what I'm saying? Hip hop and R&B. Okay. So, you know, you've had success all these years, uh, you know, with the music, with the TV, with the touring and so forth. 2020 rolls around and then news breaks that you get arrested. 2020? Yeah. Damn, it's 22. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, so according to reports, and I'm just going to read, uh, you know, I'm not saying any of this is true or not true. I'm just reading what the reports are saying, and, you know, you could address it in however way you want. So according to reports, you're being accused of participating in a scam to file fake loan applications to obtain millions of dollars uh, allocated for small businesses during the pandemic. Um, it's saying that you and another man named uh, Tanya C. Johnson... Am I pronouncing his name right? Nigga, I don't know the nigga. Never heard of him. Okay. Uh, uh, both you guys were charged uh, on a bunch of fraud complaints. Um, you guys were hit with wire fraud, uh, conspiracy to commit uh, wire fraud and bank fraud. And they say that you guys were seeking more than $24 million in PPP loans. Um, I guess along the way, they say that you bought a Ferrari for about a hundred grand and other various items and so forth. And I mean, it just really just sounded crazy once you started reading the reports. Um, what can you talk about that? Cause at this point, you know, you've already pled guilty to it and you know, you're going to start your, your prison sentence in a few days, but talk about that whole situation, how it kind of came together. So let's backtrack, right? So this was this was right around the second millennium tour when we first was going out. We did like five dates, right? COVID, we 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 did those dates. We got the deposit for that. You know what I'm saying? That bread duh. This the biggest tour in the country, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make it make sense for you. So we get the deposit for that. COVID hit. COVID hit and Remember they were saying there is no essential there is no mask for essential workers. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I was the only nigga that had face masks in America. So I might have made a quarter million dollars in like 20 days. I probably sold two million masks. You feel me? So well, I hold on, let me stop you for one second. Two million how do you get two million dollars with the masks? Well, where do these masks come from? So it just so happened that one of my manufacturers for my clothing line in China hit me like six months earlier and was like, yo, 
are you selling masks in America? I said, nah. He said, why? I, I say, why? He said, there's a virus called coronavirus and it's killing everybody in Wuhan, China. And I said, shit, that shit ain't hit over here yet. But okay, note taken. Let, but let's keep, let's stay with the business. You feel me? So when the, when the first announcement hit that COVID was hitting in America, I hit Buddy back like, hey, nigga, you still got them masks? He say, yeah. I say, oh, man, I'm finna build a website right now. By the, by the end of the night, the website was up. By as soon as I pressed launch on the website, and I, I, I mean, 30 minutes, sound, it sound crazy. 30 minutes, nigga, I made 30 racks. Feel me? And 30 minutes, boom, 30,000. Then they shut the site down. They said I was price gouging, but I wasn't. So I had to show proof I wasn't price gouging. I had to go and show what Home Depot was charging for masks, what um, shit Lowe's is charging for masks. They, it was it was ridiculous numbers. It was like twenty five dollars for a six pack, some shit like that. So I said, my mask I'm selling. It's the same price, but I'm offering free shipping. You know what I'm saying? And I give I give my customers the option to buy bulk. It's cheaper. By less, boom, they open the site back up. Man, next morning, 40000 again. Bam. Now I'm rolling. Bam, bam, bam. I, make, I make a quarter million before the end of the month. And then next thing you know, um, Donald Trump say, he said, you can go outside as long as you have on a mask and people stop buying masks. <laughs> it's a, ironic as it sounds. Like once, once he took us off lockdown and he let everybody start going back outside, the mask market declined. You know what I'm saying? So bomb. So that's that's a that's a quarter million right there. So me, you know, I'm a musician at heart. You know what I'm saying? I'm like shit. I'm finna go cop me a, a blue Lamborghini and put COVID nineteen on the license plate, right? So at the time, I want to say um, I'm consulting a record company. The record company that I'm consulting, I call them. I'm like, nigga, y'all ain't getting none of this um online money. Y'all, like, I could build you a site. You can sell hand sanitizer, anything. You know what I'm saying? It's, I'm just trying to put them up on game. I'm like, shit, I'm finna buy this Lambo, you know what I'm saying, to put COVID-19 on the plate. Dude tell me, oh, man, you know we do the financing, man. You ain't got to do that, man. We, um, we'll just do the financing for you, right? I'm like, I'm like, shit, I need to get some sprinters, too, for this tour. He say, he say, all right, cool, I got you. He called me middle of the night. Middle of the night, nigga called me. I answered the phone. He say, hey, you still need that that funding? I say, yeah. He say, send me your ID. Send me your and, and your LLC. All right, shit, nigga. I, I'm consulting the label. I, you know, this is somebody I trust. Send him the shit. I don't ask no questions, no nothing. Go to sleep. Wake up. 424000 I'm like, oh shit, you feel me? So then, and this way it get tricky, right? Because it's kind of like, can't really speak on another nigga and they shit. You know what I'm saying? But, shit, when it, once the 400, once I seen the 420, I say, what I got to give you for that? Think, you know, like a management fee. You know what I'm saying? In the music business, Everything we do is a management fee. I'm like, what I got to give you for that? He like 30%. I say, nigga, that's too much. I say, man, that's too much, dog. 30% off 420. Do the math on that. Nigga, that's 40 times 3. That one, that's 120,000, right? I'm, consult I'm consulting the record label, which is owned by a football player. You feel me? And so we kind of got a good rapport. We all pretty much trust each other. You know what I'm saying? We working together. So I done made a quarter million off these masks. I'm calling like, hey, is y'all, is y'all, do y'all see what's going on right now? Do y'all got a website up? Do you need me to build one? I can make you one for hand sanitizer or something. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, shit, I just made 250. I'm finna go cop this baby blue Lamborghini I just seen at H. Greg. <laughs> you know what I said? To put COVID-19 on the license plate. You feel me? He like, nah, man, we, we'll do the funding for you. You ain't gotta, you ain't gotta do all that. We'll do the funding because that's what they do. They fund 
You know what I'm saying? Football players and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? This this is before any PPP loan or any of that. This they 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 finance and fund football players, and I happen to um, consult one of the record companies that they manage. You feel me? So when he tell me, okay, we'll do the funding for the whips and we'll do, I say, shit, I need sprinters too for this millennium tour. And he said, all right, I got you. I'm gonna call you. He called me in the middle of the night, 12 o'clock in the morning. I'm asleep. I answered the call for him. He said, you still need the funding? I said, yeah. He said, um, all right, send me your LLC and send me your name. That's it. Nigga ain't say nothing else to me. Ain't asked me no other questions. Ain't say, send me no document, nothing. Nigga asked me for those two things. I hung up the phone, went to sleep. I woke up, 420 something thousand, 426, whatever it was. So I'm like, okay, you know what I'm saying? Buddy was official. I'm like, you know, in the music business, everything that we do is like off commission base. You feel me? Managers, they get a commission. Business managers get a commission. Everybody get a commission when an artist make money. So, you know, this nigga is a, a, a football agent. So I'm like, you know, what, what commission you want? You know what I'm saying? What I'm supposed to give you for that? He tell me 30%. I say, nigga, that's too much. I'm like, that's too much, bro. You feel me? That's 30%. That's off of 420, nigga. That's 120,000, right? So he say, man, I'm going to come get you or whatever. So long story short, fuck what he did, what I did, right? So I get him 100,000. Know what I'm saying? I give him a hundred grand, cause that that's what made sense to me. I still don't know how I got the money. I'm thinking it came from the football agent loan company. You know what I'm saying? I don't know the details of what's going on, cause this the beginning of the pandemic. Don't nobody know what a PPP is. It don't exist. It's brand new. The only reason these motherfuckers knew is because they was on that. Nigga, I'm a musician, but I don't know shit about no PPP. I don't know nothing. I barely know how to file my motherfucking taxes. Keeping it a hundred. You know what I'm saying? So it's like that shit turned from a company that I was consulting approving me to a loan to next thing, you know, I go to my accountant and I'm like, all right, nigga, you know, this what I, I want to do this or whatever with the money. And they like, yo, I I see a big chunk right here, like a hundred thousand going. Where did that go? I say, oh, I paid these dudes for getting a loan. My accountant say, yo, that's illegal. I say, what? He say, yeah, that's illegal. Hired the lawyer. Boom. That next thing you know, a couple months later, indictment. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, when I tell everybody online, like, you know what I'm saying? You got to be aware because you don't know who really got your best interest at heart. This the streets, man. Niggas trying to come up. So I'm like the biggest nigga that, that went down for this shit. So I it would be fucked up on my part to not use my platform to enlighten a motherfucker. What they do with the information, that's on them. But at least I can enlighten everybody and be so they don't get caught up how I got caught up. Because keeping it a hundred, if a nigga really was gonna scam, bro, I'm from Miami, bro. Like, it's a way you can do this shit and not have nigga a platinum recording artist record company, nigga, that been established for 20 years, put down on some paperwork with my name, with my sin. Like, nigga, this Miami. Niggas know how to get down out here. I I don't gotta do all that. I never had to. But the point is, if I'm going to scam, bro, a nigga going to do it right. You know what I'm saying? So it get, it's crazy how they run a nigga name through the mud and put me at the top of this scam. And they put a headline, 24 million on it. And just to spread awareness to everybody. You know what I'm saying? They use me as, as, a, as a marketing tool at that point. It's called influencer marketing. You feel me? Attached it to a celebrity. Oh, he bought a Ferrari. Nigga, I've nigga, I been riding foreigns, nigga, my whole life, bro. Rolls Royces. Nigga, I had the Fisker Karma first year that bitch came out. Electric Whip, how they drive a Tesla's now. I, nigga, I had that bill when it first came out. Experimental. I've been doing this, man. So, you know, 
it is what it is at this point. It's kind of like, you know what I'm saying? I just got to go lay down. It's, it's, the prosecutors don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear, I ain't know nothing. Because I'm a young black nigga. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it's, it's easier to believe, yeah, he was a part of that, than to believe, man, he got duped. You know what I'm saying? He got scammed, bamboozled. They got over on him. It's easier for the prosecutor who wants uh who wants to continue to get wins under the prosecutor's belt. It's easier for them to say all 90 people that that did these loans, they all participated. Man, all 90 of them motherfuckers ain't do that. You know what I'm saying? They ain't do that. Them niggas know what they was running around telling everybody. And then the niggas who got us the loans turn informants. They turn to the confidential informants and now they start telling, oh, we did loans for them and them and them and them and they bought this and this and that and that and that. But these are the same people. You ain't even tell them where the money came from. You told them it was coming from a football agency. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's very cloudy right now. You know what I'm saying? And, and as far as the streets go, niggas going get, to get it how they live. They going to get money. So you know, it's a very hush-hush thing because it's kind of like if I speak on it too much, they're like, oh, that nigga snitched. He gave the game away. But you know what I'm saying? So I can't really talk on it too much. Only thing I could do is just be like, you know, be careful. You know what I'm saying? Move the right way. You know, do shit the right way. Pay attention to everything that you put your name on. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's all I can say. I'm finna go do the time, you know. Fuck it. It's an experience for me. I'm going to go to jail and observe. You know what I'm saying? Might come out, make a movie about that bitch. I get firsthand experience uh, inside a prison. You know what I'm saying? And add to my experience that now I can be an actor and play a prison role because I got firsthand experience. I'm going to look at it in a positive way. And, you know, it ain't no different than being on tour, staying in a shitty ass hotel. You know what I'm saying? I tour, I, I'm on the road for a living anyway. I'm never home. So even though it, it is fucked up that, you know, I, I, I'm finna get taken away from my family. You know, I'm the major breadwinner in my family. I play a major role in my group. And, you know, and we put food on the table for all our families and all our employees. You know what I'm saying? It, but sometimes some niggas got to take them hits. For their family, for everybody. Because, nigga, I did get that money. But I blessed a lot of motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? I spread that money around. I gave a lot of motherfuckers that money. That if I, if, 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 it were, if I didn't have it, shit, I might have been tight with my little money. But since I, I was blessed with that bread, I woke up and I started sending care packages out to niggas. All the DJs got hit with some bread. Ask them. If you bump into it and say, hey, nigga, Blue sent you some money. But we don't talk about that. Feel me? I sent everybody bread. Donated to, to motherfuckers' charities and shit. I did all that. I just don't talk about none of that because I wasn't raised like that. I'm, I'm raised by a real street nigga and it's a code of silence. You just don't talk about it. And you don't brag about what you do for people either. Feel what I'm saying? Well, I mean, you mentioned the 90 people. Uh, so according to reports, there were like 90 fraudulent applications that were submitted and there was like 11 other people that were involved in this case. So the whole thing is, is really messy and involving all types of different shit. I mean, when they first arrested you, how much time did they say you're going to get in the very beginning? At 30 years. When they first arrested 30 me. 30 years. For 30 years. Yeah. They, like, they like, it's 30 years with all of the charges. But then once they going through a nigga phone and shit, they know what's, they know what's really happened. You know what I'm saying? They know what really went down. You know what I'm saying? So you can't really stick me with a 30 years for some shit you know I ain't do. But they going to get that win, though. You know what I'm saying? It's better for them to get the win. They ain't going to just throw a nigga case out. You know? They, we need a scapegoat. We need, we need somebody who's finna be a flag to let it, the whole world know, hey, don't do this shit or you going to go to prison. Feel me? Yeah, and you know, the fans cloud chase just like everyone else does. You know, it sounds a whole lot better to say Baby Blue just got caught for PPP, you know, scamming as opposed to this Tanya guy that no one knows about. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying? Right. They it paired me with a headlines. nigga. They paired me with a nigga I, I never heard of. I never met this nigga. I don't know him. 
I don't know him, his family, his organ. I don't know nothing about that. All I know is I got the bread that I got, you know what I'm saying? And I bless niggas with it. And I spread it around, dog. I ain't, it, it, even in court, they had to say that. They like, man, he spent so much money paying motherfuckers. Like, I'm in the music business. We don't really do payroll like that. You know what I'm saying? Niggas, niggas just, hey, I need you to do this camera work. What your fee is? Oh, you charge five grand. Here you go. That's five grand. You know what I'm saying? It ain't no payroll. It's everything is on the spot like that in the music, in the music business. You feel me? Even the vehicle, they, they, I see motherfuckers like, oh, you, you bought a Rari. I bought that shit under my company name. I ain't buy no fucking car. That, that shit was registered under my company name, under the LLC, and it's normal for me. It'd be different if I got that bread and I ain't do something that was, I did shit that was out of the norm. But I been riding foreigns. I been living in mansions. I been doing this shit. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it just is what it is, dog. It's, it's like, it's fucked up that it had to happen to me, but it's a blessing that it happened to me and it, and it woke everybody up. You know what I'm saying? It's, at the end of the day, it's really... It's really all about survival at this point, man. Is is this COVID shit really affected America? And everybody out here need money, man. You know what I'm saying? So a nigga like me who can who who got it and was able to spread it around and help a lot of families out, man. Fuck it, man. It is hey, heavy is the head that wear the crown, dog. You feel me? Well, originally you ended up pleading not guilty to the whole thing. But then ultimately, you ended up doing a plea deal. Well, you right? have to plead not guilty. It's that's just part of protocol. You got to plead not guilty first, and hire your lawyers. You know what I'm saying? Then they present your deal. They already hit you with 30 years. So now, when they hit you with the deal of guilty, you're gonna take it. Fed's got 98 percent commission rate. You feel me? And then my lawyers, which we felt that we could win, but at the same time, why are you gonna risk my life and my livelihood and all of my employees and my and everybody that make money when I make money. Why are you going to jeopardize like a whole, I, I don't know what to call that, bro. Like, it's just too many people that, that depend on me for me to take that shit to trial and lose and get an extensive sentence. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's going to be crippling. You feel what I'm saying? It's like, hey, man, take the lick. You know, plead guilty. The one of my one of the thing, and I, I mean, you know, there's like confidential information and shit, but one of my lawyer's biggest points to me was how are we gonna convince 12 jurors that you, a young black man, didn't do it, wasn't greedy, didn't buy it out of didn't buy the Rari out of greed, or that you didn't know about that loan. How how are we gonna convince them that? You know what I'm saying? Anybody on that jury is poor. Or looking at you with that flashy car, or, you, or they they might be they could hate you or be jealous of you, or they can't feed their kids and you just spent up a bunch of money, or you know they might have had a business that had that had to close because they didn't get money from the PPP loans, and you affected them or or affected their local pizzeria that they always go to that close. How are we gonna convince all twelve of them? You know what I'm saying? We could probably convince eleven of them, but if one of them come back and say, nah, man, he did that shit, then it's a problem. So fuck it, you know? It, it's The biggest thing is acceptance of responsibility. I accept the fact that I made a mistake. I'm a businessman, dog, and I'm intelligent too. And when it came through, I ain't even read that shit over. I ain't going to lie. You know what I'm saying? That's a lot of bread. I should have read that shit over. I should have consulted with an attorney, with a lawyer. It, man, it's a lot of coulda, woulda, shouldas that I should have did, but I didn't. So I have to accept my responsibility in the situation and say, I fucked up. I made a mistake. You know what I'm saying? You know, and, and shit, I ain't squeaky clean either, God damn it. It's, you know, to, to a degree at some point, you know what I'm saying? You know, I may, maybe maybe I did what they, what they call it, um turn a blind eye to what could be going on. You know what I'm saying? So that's the biggest thing, man. Accept the responsibility. Do your time. Be a man. Re come, come home and boss the fuck up, man, and, and do what I've been doing, dog. Well, you're going through this whole situation, and then last April, uh, April 22nd, I guess you and your cousin are out at a bowling alley? 
what happens next? Yeah, I'm, I'm at the bowling alley, my nigga, and um, you know, I, I I do this big. I don't even really go out like that, but I know I know I'm probably finna do some time and shit, so I'm trying to have some family time. So I invite a few friends and family out, and we go bowling. I don't go out like that, dog. And if I do go out, I got security, niggas strap. It's, you know, this Miami. Niggas know how to move. And really, I, I, no bullshit, man. My face clean. It, technically, I ain't even got a role like that. Like, they're not going to try me like that. You understand what I'm saying? Like, you know, we cut from a good cloth. Niggas know who to try and they know who not to try. You know what I'm saying? So, but I'm at the bowling alley and, you know, the shooters ain't pulled up. This night, for some reason, they ain't pull up, dog. So I'm talking to this nigga. I walk out the bowling alley, and he go to he go to Jack Boy. He like get that shit up. Don't say nothing. So my first thought is like, oh, a nigga playing with me, right? I like nah, a nigga playing with me. You feel me? But I look, I'm like shit. Buddy got a pistol on. I see it. I see it, feel me? And um, the nigga, the nigga had the gun and he and he pointed at my cousin. I thought he finna bust my cousin. No bullshit. I say, damn, I ain't finna let no nigga kill my cousin, bro. I snatched the gun, huh? When I snatched the gun, I think that bitch went off, bomb, and I think it ricocheted off the car and hit me in the shoulder. That bitch went through my lung, collapsed my lung, got stuck in my my back next to my spine. You feel me? So now we out there tussling this shit, you know. And um, then a second shooter came. You feel me? I'm like, oh shit, nigga. I'm like, these niggas finna kill me. Fuck it. I like, I'm like, fuck it. Accept it. Like, fuck it. You feel me? So a nigga like, give me, give me the chain. I'm like, nigga, I ain't taking my chain off, nigga. And um, you know, nigga trying to snatch the chain, but nigga, you you ain't finna get this big shit off, nigga. That's a Cuban, nigga. This is the biggest Cuban, nigga. So nigga, nigga try to snatch at this shit. And I'm like, um, I'm like, nigga, I ain't taking my shit off, nigga. And tussle a little bit more, then them niggas ran off. I guess it was too much time. They probably thought police was gonna come. Maybe they heard sounds. I don't know. But them niggas, them niggas took off. And then um shit, I go check for my cousin. You feel me? And when I look in the car, that nigga ain't in there. I just knew this nigga got hit. I'm like, damn, they done killed my cousin. When I look in the car, he ain't there. I look up, this nigga, this nigga at the bowling alley entrance. So I'm like, all right, let me let me go back over there. But I ain't finna run. I ain't no bitch. I like, I ain't finna run to the front like no hoe ass nigga. You know what I'm saying? So I, I walk to the front, dripping blood and shit. I can't even feel it. You can't feel you can't feel the shot. All I can feel is the blood dripping from my fingertips. And you know, I go in the hospital. I mean, I go to the front door. I tell him, I say, hey, call my old boy. And I say, call the ambulance. You feel me? And then that's when I felt I couldn't really breathe like that. So I'm like, yeah, take take the Cuban off real quick so I could breathe. And then shit. Next thing I know, ambulance came. Shit, I'm in a coma two motherfucking days. You know? I think it was two days. I don't even know how long I was in the coma for. But, you know, in the coma. And then shit. When I woke up, god damn it. Shit, I can't even talk. I can't talk. I can't walk. I can't move the arm. I'm just fucked. You know, and it was a, a real sweet old lady at the hospital, man. Held a nigga down. You know, every day fed me, cleaned me. And um, shit, had to learn how to walk again, learn how to use my arm, learn how to breathe again. I couldn't breathe. I was on the breathing machine. I had to actually learn how to breathe through the little machines and shit they gave me. And shit, I'm I'm still here today. Bless. I mean, you know, as someone who who's had money for a while, you know, and I and I have you know jewelry as well. All my jewelry is insured. So if someone steals my jewelry, I'll file an insurance claim in my police report, and I'll get pretty much what I paid for it. Why at that very moment, you know, I mean, number one, was your jewelry jewelry insured? That's a, that's that's here here and or there. The problem okay. is, but I mean, re re well, regardless. Okay, so let, let me just, let me just regardless, say this. I understand where you're going insured, with it. Insured, insured or not, ain't ain't nothing worth your life. It ain't right? about that. Nigga ain't finna be walking around with my shit. You understand what I'm saying? It's 
at the end of the day, integrity is everything. Character is everything. We Miami niggas, man. Like a a, a Cuban link nigga. That's that. For a Miami nigga, any other nigga, yeah, they probably would have gave that shit up. I, I, hey, you see it all the time. Niggas get killed and they get robbed and niggas be on the internet with their shit. I just couldn't see that, bro. I ain't finna let a nigga, you know. I just couldn't imagine that. I couldn't fathom that. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't let that happen. I, I'd rather butt the jack than a nigga be holding my shit on the internet like, yeah, I took that nigga shit. You know what I'm saying? And that's just me. That ain't saying that was the right thing to do. You know, I wouldn't advise that to nobody else. But at the same time, shit, nigga, be a man. A man gonna be a man. I, I don't know, bro. You know what I'm saying? All I know is, you know, I'm still here. You know what I'm saying? And it's a blessing to be here. I ain't the baddest nigga on earth. You know what I'm saying? I ain't saying that. I'm just saying, shit, I, I wasn't feeling that. I wasn't, I wasn't feeling taking my shit off and giving it to another nigga. You know what I'm saying? I mean, the guys ran off. They, they didn't take any, any of your chains or anything else like that. Uh, but I'm assuming with the bowling alley, there's cameras and I don't know if there's witnesses around or whatever. Did they ever catch the dudes who did it? Who knows? Who knows? Okay. If, if for example, they approached you today and said, listen, we, we just caught the guys who shot you. Here's a picture of them. We just need you to, uh, you know, file a police report or, you know, take the stand or whatever else. Would you do it? I don't know. I got to consult with some of the big homies and see what's the proper thing to do. Right. I mean, because at the end of the day, you were a victim in that situation. It's not like you and these guys were hustling together and someone gets caught and you're telling on them to, to try to lessen your time. You're minding your own business. You see what I'm saying? I don't know. I, I would have to talk to some big homies and see what they think the proper thing to do. You know what I'm saying? It's a certain okay. protocol of shit that you're supposed to do. Who knows? Got it. Got Same it. Me. Well, regardless, you end up surviving. Um, you know, do you still have, you know, medical situations around that shooting or are you pretty healed up? Yeah, yeah. This is this a lifelong injury, man. This is a gunshot wound to my lung, too. Yeah. It's, you know, it's going to have lifelong residual effects, man. It's, it's never just going to yeah. be the same. You know what I'm saying? Even on tour, like, my even my vocal cords wasn't normal. You know what I'm saying? And my breathing backstage was, wasn't normal. It wasn't like, you know, when a nigga a jit and performing and got full win. You know what I'm saying? I'm really out there busting my ass, you know, performing, giving it 100% for the fans, you know. But shit, that's, you know, that's my problem. You know what I'm saying? Well, ultimately, you did survive that. But then, you know, there's still the whole, you know, PPP loan situation. I, I sued their ass, you know. too. I sued, I sued that bowling alley, too. Shit. Oh, really? Hell yeah. Is that still still ongoing? Yeah. Yeah, I sued the bowling okay. alley. Shit. Cut that check, man. The the security yeah. guard that was there ran. Now, even though, shit, I, nigga, normally I got my own niggas with me. You understand what I'm saying? And, you know, the shooters that would have been with me 24-7, they wasn't there. And the other niggas that was there was inside. I ended up walking outside with my cousin, where normally I wouldn't even be outside by myself like that. But the security that was there, nigga, ran and hid, and he an armed security guard. Like, nah, man, y'all liable, man. You tripping. Bust a shot in the air or something, nigga. Don't run. There you go. I ain't even run, nigga, and I'm the nigga shot. You understand what I'm saying? I ain't even run. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're okay, man. So you get, you get through that, and, you know, right now, this is February 2nd. You turn yourself in in five days to do 20 months. Uh, number one, have you done any sort of jail stints or anything nah. up until this point? Nah, I ain't, I ain't never been to prison, dog. I've been doing okay. music my whole life, man. <laughs> yeah. I ain't, you know, it is what it is, though. Feel me? I mean, with this thing, five days from now, you have less than a week to essentially live whatever life you could live you know, as a free man before turning yourself in. How do you feel about the whole situation? And hold on. How the fuck you knew I pleaded guilty though? Cause you posted that shit when I you posted I pleaded guilty before I even pleaded guilty, nigga. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Huh? My bad. <laughs> <laughs> How the fuck well, you my, got my, I, I don't know, man. I mean we 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 source we source shit from, you know, we 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 source shit from other uh 
you know, uh, news sources, sometimes we don't get it exactly right. You know, if there was a problem, you could have reached out and we would have we would have corrected it. But ultimately, man, you, soon you as plead guilty. Soon as I made the decision to plead guilty, I just talked about it internally. Nigga, you was like, baby blue finna plead guilty. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. I was like, this nigga Vlad, this motherfucking goat. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> dude tripping. All right, what was your question though? My bad, dog. <laughs> well, well, my, well, my question is, you know, for someone who's never been to prison before, who's lived lived a dope lifestyle, who's toured around the world and had money and so forth, now in five days you have to turn yourself in to live in a cage with a bunch of men for 20 months. How are you? How are you really getting your head around that, man? It's a new journey. You feel me? For me, my whole life been exciting, bro. In this interview, look everything we done talked about, my nigga. I shot myself two years old. I live. Feel me, I, nigga? I was in college at sixteen. End up being a platinum recording artist. You know how many niggas want to make it in music? End up going platinum, bro. End up having a number one album in the country. Feel me? End up, nigga, bucking the jack, surviving that bitch. Got the biggest Cuban link in the world. You feel me? On tour, sold out. Reality shows, loving hip hop, representing the whole city. Shit. My life is exciting, dog. Like, all right, I'm going to go to jail and I'm going to meet some, you know, some new niggas. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to have that under my belt. And who knows what, what the future holds, you know what I'm saying? Like, shit, one thing for sure, I'm a survivor. That's for sure. I'm a survivor, the proof in the pudding, you feel me? I'm a survive that, I'm a jump out, get back to the music, might shoot a movie or two. I just filmed Shatters with Kamani Marley, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Oh, Shatters part two? Shatters two. Vendetta. Oh, it's finally it's finally coming out. Okay, yeah. I love that movie. Yeah, that's probably okay. gonna come out while I'm in prison. Like, bruh, nigga, I'm blessed as fuck. Highly favored. You know what I'm saying? And this is just the beginning for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm a I'ma always find the positivity in the situation and don't look back. You know what I mean? Look forward. Look look forward to the future. Look forward to what's to come. So to a degree, even though as cliche as it don't sound, this shit sound crazy, but it's, this shit kind of exciting. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of exciting, dog. Well, I remember you went on social media uh, recently. You said that you're not the only celebrity to get these PPP loans and so forth. Um, you know, and then people started to say, oh, you're snitching and, and whatever else, and you, you address that as well. I mean, I don't consider that snitching because you're not naming anybody. Nah. But you're saying that a lot of other, but you know, without naming any names, without giving any details, are, were there a lot of other people that were doing similar to what you were doing? So the thing about it is, the reason why I had said, hey, I ain't the only celebrity that got it, is because I seen so much traffic and chatter that was, they were, oh, nigga, you broke because you got the PPP. Like, nigga, everybody got it because it was for businesses. It was a legit legal loan. But they tried to say a nigga snitch because I said other celebrities got it. Nah, what I'm trying to say is, why the fuck would you think I would do it illegally and they would do it legally? Something ain't adding up. You understand what I'm saying? Is whoever would recommend that would be a business, somebody, a financial advisor. The person who financially advised me just fuck me. That's all that was. You know what I'm saying? It, and I ain't call no names. I ain't say, oh, this nigga or that nigga did it. I just say, yo, you'll be, you know, if you really, if you really look, you'd be like, damn, everybody really got it. Who you, you'd be surprised who got it. And then maybe y'all wouldn't be looking at me so crazy because I got it. You know what I'm saying? It, it, the problem is they attached it with the word scam. Oh, he scammed and got it. I ain't scam and do shit. I ain't do no paperwork. I ain't sign shit. I ain't do nothing. You know what I'm saying? I'm just a nigga who received it. You feel me? So it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, uh, in July of 2020, uh, we had reported that Kanye got a PPP loan, somewhere between 2 and $5 million. And, you know, <laughs> this guy's a billionaire. Uh, so a lot of people got loans. I mean, I remember when it first came out, you know, I was like, you know, I went to my CFO. I'm like, should we do it? And she was like, nah. She's like, this is, this is probably going to be a trap. Because after they give it to you, they're going to start digging through all your finances. And 
even if it was a legit loan, if they prove that you didn't necessarily need it, because at the time we were doing okay financially, she was like, yo, this is going to hit us bad. Let's just leave the whole thing alone. And I took her advice and ended up being great advice. You know? Great advice, bro. Because I'm, I'm one of the niggas that you're looking at that once they told me what you supposed to do with that bread, I did it. I paid everybody. The vehicles was bought under the business. Like, that shit is in the, in the guidelines of what to do with the money. That wasn't my problem. My problem wasn't how I spent the money. It was the person who prepared my paperwork. He got indicted. And when he got indicted, this nigga snitched on 90 niggas. He's like, hey, I did all 90 of these people paperwork. So all 90 of these motherfuckers who trusted him and didn't know what he was doing, they all went down. Innocent motherfuckers, movie stars, athletes, musicians, your mom and pop store owners, barber shops, everybody. You know what I'm saying? It's it all came from the one person. It wasn't it wasn't the, the that we participated in a, in a scam. We got scammed, but the government had to get that money back. They need restitution, so they got to put the case on everybody to get the restitution to a degree. You know what I'm saying? But something like that. You know what I mean? Okay. And do you have to pay restitution? Yeah. How much? I don't know. I don't know. They ain't tell me yet. Okay. They ain't tell me yet. Okay. Well, look, Baby Blue, man, um, at the end of the day, you know, what happened happened. Uh, 20 months, for someone who hasn't done any prison time, I'm sure it sounds like a lot, but in the grand scheme of things, 20 months is a doable amount of time. Yeah, you know, it, you know I, I don't think I'm gonna have to do all of it. You know, like at the end of the day, the the purpose of of having these conversations is, you know, partly to educate too. You know what I'm saying? It ain't, all right, yeah, I'm gonna give you my side of the story, but I want whoever watching it to be educated. Like, you know, this the feds. You only got to do 85 percent of that time, and then, you know, they passed a new law now that take time off the longer you in. Then you could participate in programs, get time cut off. You know what I'm saying? So. You know, I might be home, bro, by Christmas. You never know. With a story to tell. You feel me? And I'll do another Vlad interview and tell you what, what life in prison was like. You know what I'm saying? There you go, man. There you go. Well, listen, man, just do your time. Keep your head down. Don't get caught up in no no prison politics bullshit. Uh, you're only there for a short period of time. You, you know, you're going to have lots of fans in there, I'm sure. You know, um, you know, and at the end of the day, 20 months is something that I think anyone could realistically do and walk away from and get back to the life that they had before. And listen, man, you had a hell of a life. Uh, platinum records, sold out tours, you know, beautiful women, exotic cars, mansions, flying all around the world. You know, you lived the life, you know, you lived 10 lifetimes. So to do 20 right. months or even less than that, it's not too bad in the grand scheme of things of your life. You it adds I mean? to the story, bro. It, it, the story wouldn't be great by the time you get to the end without something like this. Even Count of Monte Cristo end up locked up and then jumped out and balled and took care of all his enemies. Like, you got to have something that, that, that makes it, that has climax. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, and, and for me to be a creative and an artistic person, like, yeah, I'm thinking about all that. I'm like, shit. I'm finna do the movie about this bitch. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna I'm write the book about it. While, while I'm in prison, I might write the book, write the movie, and jump out, you know, and produce that. You know what I'm saying? Because that's that, that's what our culture need, man. We shit, 50 Cent got this shit in the head lot, dog. Because he the only one producing that type of content for us, and we need it. We, we need something to motherfucking watch every day. So, goddammit, I tell this story, you know what I'm saying? In a book, on film. On the album, you feel me? Do the do the Vlad in the, the interview on that bit. All that bit. There you have it. There you have it. Well, baby blue man, I appreciate you coming in and being so honest and telling your story, man. Uh, you know, can't wait to to do this this next interview when you get out. You know, have a few cool little prison stories along the way, man. Get back to your career. Get back to making money. Get back to spending time with your family, man, and live a you know good rest of your life. Yeah, 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 man. I appreciate you for having me too, dog. Of course, man. Of course, because I was DMing. We were, we were, you know, we were talking to each other while all this was happening, and I'm like, yo, whenever you're ready, we got a platform for you. And you're Mon like, all right, let me months just get ago, through this and 
We was on yep, this months ago, ago, you know what I'm saying? But I ain't yep. want to really speak on it because I was going through the case. And then even of right course. now, where them niggas still going through trial, so I don't want to speak on them niggas too much. I, you know what I'm saying? It is what it is. I ain't no motherfucking snitch. I, it, I ain't going to speak on them niggas like that. So I couldn't really give you everything. But I mean, I think I gave you a good interview. You feel me? Of course, man. Of course, man. Well, listen, man. I appreciate you sitting down. Wish you all the best. Until next time. Yo. Peace. My man.